Hello everyone and welcome to today's Alexa Repair Basics I'm Stephanie. On behalf of the Alexa Continuing Education Committee, I am delighted to introduce our presenters, Peter Verheyen and Marianne Hanley. Peter Verheyen is Head of Preservation and Conservation at Syracuse University Library. Peter began his career in preservation as a work study student at John Dean Hopkins, where he repaired and rehoused circulating collections. Graduation, he studied binding and conservation in Germany and Switzerland. Since then, he has worked both in private practice and research and free preservation. At Syracuse, he established a conservation lab for the treatment of special collections materials and developed a high density storage system for architectural drawings. At Archival 101, an Alexa webinar. Marianne Hanley is Assistant Conservator in the Department of Preservation and Conservation at Syracuse as well. Her responsibilities include managing the repair and rehousing of circulating collections, including the training for study students. She's also continuing the bookbinding and conservation training with conservators David Stokoe and Peter Hines. Since Marianne has worked in both public and academic libraries, she is collaborating with the development of a basic book repair program that will benefit many different institutions with varying types of skill levels. Before we begin, a few quick notes on today's webinar. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat box on your screen, and our presenters will do their best to answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Also, please note that today's presentation will be recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to that recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. The presentation will also be archived and freely available at the Alex webinar website. Thanks to Neil Schumann Publishers for sponsoring this webinar so it could be made freely available to everyone. I also wanted to note that some of you um, have said that your colleagues are having some difficulty in logging in, so please let them know that the webinar will be posted and freely available to everyone on the Lex website, and we apologize for that inconvenience. With that, I'll turn the program over to Peter and Marianne. Thank you very much, Thank and you. welcome everyone. So today's presentation is entitled Book Repair Basics for Libraries and at the, at the beginning we'll just outline the aims and scope of our presentation. What we're going to try to do is familiarize all of you with the dis different aspects of circulating collections repair for a vari wide variety of libraries, whether it's a school, a public, or an academic. And we'll do that by showing you techniques in, with images and video as well. The video is kind of a first, so we'll see how that goes. This presentation should not, however, be construed as a how-to workshop. And at the end of our workshop, what we'll do is we'll give you resources for further training, but we will be showing you in more or less real time how a lot of these basic repairs are completed. And it's not aimed at the treatment of special collections items in any regard. And that's really something where we'll talk again at the end about how to find a conservator to work with on those. Circulating Collections Repair at Syracuse and many other research academic libraries, materials are retained for the long term. As a research facility library that serves the university, we are responsible for collecting organizing and providing access to scholarly information. Our weeding of collections is very selective. When an item is weeded or deselected, any decision to withdraw an item must take into consideration the value of the item to future research and teaching. Selection criteria for repair in general, the item circulates and upon its return, library staff observes the physical condition of the book is poor and its physical integrity has been compromised. We also periodically, proactively concentrate on certain areas of the collection that are heavily used. Our types of treatment when an item comes into the preservation lab, we set up a triage area where we decide what type of treatment each item needs. It could be just a simple repair, 
maybe it just needs a page tip back in or it's hinge tightened or it could be something a little more involved like a spine repair rebacking um, where maybe the spine is torn or ripped and we need to replace it or it could be something where the binding has been split in pieces and we need to completely rebind it and with this we would send it to a commercial bindery pretty much because the we can't repair it here um, and instead we would send it out because the cost versus the in-house repair would be much more cost effective. In a completely different mentality, we have the public and school library context. Materials that are not necessarily retained for the long term. This would be items that would circulate, we would repair them, they would circulate, we would repair, circulate again, and then we would weed them. You would pretty much get your money's worth out of the item and we're talking about something along the lines of maybe a, a Harry Potter book. Treatments often minimal to enable a few more circulations. What we would do is not address the complex structural issues, things like spines or detached boards. These would be more likely to use self-adhesive products rather than wet adhesives things that would require less infrastructure and training. It would be a quicker sort of a peel in place on the item. These would not be used for the long term. We would think of this more as a quick fix. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover the tools that are used in book repair and those are fairly universal even with advanced conservation treatments. Adhesives and other materials, we will show some simple repairs, mending tears, doing a tip-in, hinge tightening. We'll also show some spine repairs, a simple what I'm calling quick and dirty or as we also say here meatball surgery where we're replacing just the spine, the boards are still well attached and then also one that's a little bit more involved where we're going to replace a completely missing spine, the boards are off and things like that. The slide that you see in front of you is examples of essential tools that we use in the book repair process. I'll start from the right hand side with just a large pair of scissors. As we move on you'll see we used a straight edge knife. This is important that you keep the knife blade sharp by replacing the blades often. Next on to the left hand side you'll see a tool called an awl which is a pointed tool used for making holes and we use for sewing pamphlets into binders but that is another class. The next tool that you'll see is the bone folder and the bone folder is a dull edge device used to crease material. It's often made from animal bone, hence its name, and there's also synthetic alternatives available that are made from plastics or Teflon. In the videos, which you will see shortly, we've used the Teflon bone folder. You'll also see that the tools are lying on a cutting mat and that's for protecting your cutting services, surfaces and next would be the brushes. It's important to clean the tools after use to keep in good working order. In terms of adhesives we're going to avoid duct tape, packing tape, rubber cement, glue sticks, all of which somehow find their way into book repair operations 
at one time or another, or we get to deal with the consequences. These are some rather dramatic images that were provided by an intern of ours here at Syracuse. And you can see in the, in, in the image on the right, they've gotten very creative in helping protect the images. While her, you know, horrible in terms of their impact on the item, they are generally well-intentioned. Some other adhesive products that we would use are these that are commercially available from vendors such as Capco, Gaylord, Demco, pretty much all the library vendors. And these are used to hold magazines together, protect the corners of the books, apply a simple repair at the head or tail that's the top or bottom of the spine of the book, just to keep things together. And they are not necessarily something that we're going to cover in this workshop. The adhesives that we use for our repairs are archival PVA, which is, it's a white glue. It's like Elmer's, but it's formulated to be a lot more flexible. And that's important because if, a, if the adhesive is very stiff, then it causes the spine of the book to crack and fall apart sooner than it would. For repairing tears with rare book conservation, we use Japanese paper and wheat paste. In the context of most of our circulating collections repair, we'll end up using a product like Filmoplast P, which is an acid-free tissue kind of paper with an acrylic adhesive that's not going to discolor or ooze or anything like that, and it just goes on better. What you see in front of you is some simple repairs, things like a page tear on the left-hand side, and on the right, you will see a page that has completely been, has come out, and something that we all see from time to time. Now we will move into a simple repair and you can go ahead and watch the video. The first thing that you see happening is I'm using uh, the Filmoplast P mending tape and because it's thinner and a little bit more flexible I don't use the full width of the roll because it's not needed for most repairs. We recommend cutting it in half before applying. What I'm doing right there is aligning the parts of the tear by laying the paper on top of each other, then placing the filmoplast over and rubbing it lightly. Then you see that I'm using the scissors to cut right at the end of the page to make a clean line. Page tip-ins are another very common repair that we have to perform here. And very often that will happen because in paperbacks they tend to fall out. Sometimes students will tear sections, whole articles, things like that out. So we're reinserting loose pages. And you can see here with this example, it's an adhesive bound book and the pages are coming out fairly easily. What Marianne is doing here is she's applying a very thin bead um, line of PVA along the edge of the paper. And it's very important that you not go too far in to the paper because that puts a lot more adhesive down and makes that section, that part of the book, a little less flexible. Um, but you do need enough for it to hold into the spine, hold on to the spine. And if you're doing multiple pages, so let's say a student has torn out a chapter and you have to replace it. Um, very often from interlibrary loan, we'll get photocopies. We make sure that those are, A, printed double-sided so that they create far less bulk, but then also what we'll do, and we're not going to show that in this video, is we will glue those together as a block first and then insert them into the book, which is a lot easier. And so this is a way to really extend the life of your books and make sure that the content is there.
We're now putting in the third page and then position it. Close it carefully and we'll put a weight on it. If you have a press and there are simple book presses that are available, you can give it a good what we call a nip and that'll help keep the book, make that bond a lot tighter. The next slide that you see here is a hinge tightening. The hinge along the spine of the book is loose, as you can see. Loose or shaken hinges are one of the leading causes of further breakdown of the structure of the book. Hinge tightening is a quick and easy and what you see me doing here is I'm taking the glue and I'm spreading it onto an acrylic rod and I'm turning the rod around so that I get glue on all different sides of it. Then I open the book up as wide as I can and insert the acrylic rod inside the gutter of the book. I'm trying not to get glue on the spine. I'm trying to have it just go straight down into the gutter. What you saw there was me twisting it around so that the glue spread all around inside. Then I pull out my tool and just run it along the edge and make sure that the glue gets deep down into the edge. I place a heavy weight over it and let it sit. And with this kind of repair, very often, especially if the, material, the book cloth is older, you want to be careful with the amount of pressure that you apply because you don't want to tear through that cloth. So one of the things that you can do is lay a clean piece of paper over it and then rub down and that new paper will help cushion that pressure a little bit and make it less likely to tear. There's also a very good publication that was put out by ALA probably about 15 years ago um, on book repair and it covers the techniques that we just described and when you go to the site at the very end there will be a link to the publication that is also available online. What we're going to get into now are some of the more complex spine repairs and you can see an assortment of typical damages that we see here. Um, you have this green cloth case binding and you can see how the outer joint is torn. Um, we have this paper textbook, this paper binding on this textbook and you see how the head cap, this area is torn and then this other book where we also have, you know, the boards are off, the spine is fairly ratty and you can also see some water damage and these are fairly typical repairs that we would encounter here. Tape is one of the most common items in book library um, vendors catalogs for book repair and it's often used to reinforce a weakened spine and if you think about the clear tape basically that's going over it's going onto the boards, it's going across the whole spine, but you, can, you read the title and everything through it. You're not actually replacing the spine. And in our research library context, that is not something that we do, but in other contexts, such as public libraries, school libraries, that's fairly common. Um, it allows a book to be circulated several more times. It couldn't be redone, maybe. but as Marianne pointed out earlier, it helps extend the value of that item to the collection. You're not replacing it right away. But it can be damaging to a book if you need to undo that repair and the adhesives that are used will many times they can ooze um, thereby getting on other books and cause other damages. 
but they are fairly simple. And if your hinges are also shaken, you can combine the taped repair on the outside with the hinge tightening, for example. There are some better book claws, and we'll be, the next repair that we'll be demonstrating makes use of the Filmoplast T, which is a rayon fabric with an acrylic adhesive that comes on rolls, and most of the library vendors will sell that. What we use here at Syracuse is a library-grade buckram, a book, you know, sturdy book cloth, and we will use um, PVA to attach that book cloth to the book along with the other steps that we do. It's stronger than the self-adhesive product and will hold up a lot longer, but depending on the context, both can be effective. So our first repair is going to be a simple reback. The boards will still be attached, and Marianne will tell us more about that. Okay, as you can see, or you can't it's see coming. right now, the kind of repair is used, okay? What you see here is me lining up the edge of the board and cutting through it because we're going to be removing the spine. We flip it over and do the same thing on the outside of the other side using a straight edge knife. And what I'm doing here is using a lifting knife to remove the buckram from the book. Some books are a little bit easier than others. Some lift right off because the glue is older and doesn't adhere anymore. Others take a little bit of time. And I also use my hand to pull it off a little bit also just to help it along. You can see that I've removed the spine from the book and the edge is pretty clean. I just need to cut a little bit of few stray threads along the book. The next thing that we're going to do with pull out our hand press and place the book inside, make sure it's tight so that the book is not going to fall over. We just use a piece of scrap paper and measure from shoulder to shoulder on the spine. And you really want to be exact in this measurement because that is how we will determine the width of the spine board. You can see what I have is I am moving the marks from my scrap piece of paper onto the spine stiffener. We use 10 point boards for that. Then I'm taking it over to the board shear and cutting. Now, if you don't have a board shear, don't worry because you can use paper cutters. Um, you can use just a straight edge on a sitting on a board also. I don't know if you noticed, um, but on my spine stiffening board, 
there were some pencil lines on there and that was showing us the grain direction. You want to make sure that you follow the correct grain direction so that it doesn't get bumpy, it stays smooth underneath. What I did was I just put the spine stiffener, I laid it flat on top of the boards and I'm measuring it and cutting it to fit the height of the board. Next, I'm taking the self-adhesive buckram and measuring it along the boards. I'm leaving just about a half an inch on either side for my turn-ins. I mark the area where I'm going to cut it. Just measure again. And then I just rub it down on either side just to give a little extra crease. And then I take it out on the bench and I just reinforce those creases because that will help in the placement when we place the spine stiffener on the edge of the book. We put the book back into the hand press. Peel it Peel the paper adhesive off the back. Then I place it down on the bench and put the spine stiffener right in the middle of the buckram. Put it right up to the edge where I made those creases. And like I said, then when I place it on top of the book, I know exactly where it should go and exactly where the end of the spine stiffener should go. I'm setting it on the book but I'm not pressing very hard. Because when it goes back on the bench, I want to pull it off and this time really press it in to make sure that the adhesive is getting into the, gu the gutter of the book. You can see I press it first with my fingers and then I pull out the bone folder and make sure that it's pushed right down into the gutter. I'm seeing a question on the side that's asking me what the spine stiffener is made from. And that is made from 10 point cardboard board. It's a, it's, a, it's a folder stock and it's a 10 point is about the weight of a manila folder and we get it in 30 by 40 sheets from Gaylord but all the other vendors have it as well. As you can see, I have made sure that both sides have adhered by pressing down with my bone folder. Now I'm going to 
the bottom of the book and I'm placing sort of a V cut so that my turn in will go around the edge of the book. There's my V cut happening right there. And I'm just pressing down to make sure that the buckram is adhering. I go to the other side. I do the same thing, placing a cut and then another cut so that you're essentially cutting out a triangle shaped piece. Then you just have the piece left in the middle and what I do with that piece is I take the scissors and I just snip it off on either end, each corner, because this is going to be tucked down into the spine of the book and I want it to lay smooth. By making the little extra cuts, it allows it to lay a little smoother. And then I'm using the bone folder and pressing it down inside and I put the bone folder right inside of the spine to again make sure that it's smooth. And you can see from looking at the side of the book that how important it is for that spine stiffer, stiffener to be exactly the length of the board. If it isn't, it's going to stand up a little higher than the rest of the book or shorter. Here I am at the other side working on the turn-ins. Making that first cut and folding it over. Making sure that it's adhering and taking my bone folder and just pressing it down, going over it to make sure that it's smooth. We have an expression that we use, we don't want pencil pockets in the turn-ins where you want them to go tight around the edge of the book and you don't want a little, little pocket there showing on the end big enough for a pencil to fit through. I'm doing the same thing on the other side, leaving my piece in the middle again, snipping the ends. And sometimes you don't like the way your corners look, so you snip them again. Then I take the bone folder and again just push it right down inside. The spine of the book. And as you can see, it's nice and straight and it runs the same height of the board of the book. Then to just make sure again that it's down, the buckram is down into the gutter, we just give it a, another pass through with the bone folder. Are there any questions at this point? Because I think, you know, if there are, we can address them. One of the things I did want to mention is the hand press, which may be completely new for some of you. That's a tool that's used a lot in book binding. It's also called a finishing press, and we got them from Talus. There's other vendors, and they're about $100. But that's really invaluable because it provides, it's effectively, it's a third hand and allows us to, you know, have both of our hands free to do the work that we need to without having to worry about, is the book going to fall over? Is the book going to slide and you're going to create lots of dog ears or something like that? Because it's not really a good idea to have an unsupported book standing on the, um, on the bench. You can cause more damage than normal. We do have a question coming in. Okay. The question is, what if the book doesn't have a real spine? Just the pages are glued together. 
So you're saying that the spine is completely missing and um, it's just like an adhesive, are you, are you saying like a mass market paperback? In that case, what you could do is use a product such as this or another better quality um, tape and adhere that directly to the spine. But before you do that, you want to make sure of two things. One, that the book block isn't falling into multiple pieces. In that case, it's either cheaper to replace it or to send it out to a bindery. Or alternatively, um, you know, you need to clean the spine if there's loose bits of paper, mass the paper sometimes delaminates, you want to make sure that you have a smooth surface that you can adhere that fabric to. Okay, we've got another question. Would you recommend a high quality brand of scissors which are appropriate for these materials? I really like the Fiskars. Those are the ones with the orange handles or the Dolly, D-A-H-L-E. And you want to get as Marianne was saying earlier on, you want to A, keep your tools clean, and that's really, really critical. If you have glue on the cutting edge of a scissor, pair of scissors, it's not going to cut. But you also want to buy the best tools that you can afford because they do last longer. Get it, using really basic school scissors like you would give an elementary school class is not very effective. They don't cut terribly well. So to answer your question, I, I, I look at the Fiskars and the Dolly, and they've held up really well, and those are among my favorites. Okay, we have another question. I thought adhesive should not go in the gutter, but only onto the boards. Have no, I been laboring under a misconception? Kind of. Um, in the case where the boards are on, you have the end paper that's folded, and that goes from, it's your fly leaf, folds back on itself, and then that gets attached to the board. You really do want to have that cloth attached in that groove of the book, or Marianne referred to as the gutter, because otherwise what you end up with is effectively a loose hinge, a shaken hinge, without actually having the book be damaged. It, that bond between the outer fabric just in that groove, not on the spine, really helps reinforce that joint overall, that hinge overall, and helps the book last longer. We might be able to answer one more and then we'll, okay, we're going to move on to our next repair. And this one... We do have one question. What about the imprint on the spine that was removed? We are going to touch on that on our next video. Thank you. Um, yes, we did cut that short during filming. Um, the next repair that we're going to be doing is a full reback, which is, we refer to them as fulls here at Syracuse. And we do those when the boards are detached when the spine linings on the text block are falling off, when, when it's basically we need to address more structural issues. And for many smaller libraries that don't have, let's say, a very active book repair program or a certain skill level, this is something that then might be better off sent to a library binder. The materials are essentially the same, but what we're going to be demonstrating here is using a library buckram with PVA and then our spine stiffener will again be the 10 point folder stock. The other material that we will use is it's a hint what we call hinge cloth. It's basically a starch filled thinner cloth that you can get from um, most li or some library vendors on rolls. We have all our rolls of materials are cut to approximately, I believe, four inches wide. And that allows us to just pull it off, cut to the length that we need, and then work with it rather than cutting full sheets and dealing with more scrap. That hinge cloth comes the same way. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But the re on the exterior, the repairs will look more or less the same.
so again, you know, we're going to be, we examine the book and you can see that the board is detached, that the spine itself is torn. On the other hand, on the back, it's still well attached, but we will remove that. But that's not uncommon since the most wear on a book occurs on the front hinge. The next thing, one of the next things we do is, again, we cut the spine off. We cut on the board, you know, in maybe an eighth or sixteenth of an inch because we want to have a clean edge to adhere that cloth to, but it's also a lot safer than cutting through the, the joint, through that groove, and into the text block where you'll end up with a lot of missing pages, which you then have to deal with, and the tip-in technique is not necessarily applicable then. So now we lift the material off of the sides again, and you know this is it's the same thing that we demonstrated in the first repair. But we're letting you see it again. And we take our little lifting knife and we just get underneath that cloth a little bit and then just peel it off. In this case, it came off a little bit easier than with the previous book. And adhesives really do vary. Some books come apart very easily. Others are much more stubborn. Next, we remove this board. And we do that because it's easier to do the, that repair with both boards off. It does seem a little counterintuitive, though. We'll clean up the edge. We'll use the scissors for that. And then you can see that some of that spine lining paper that's on the text block is loose. And what we're going to do now is we're basically going to remove as much of that spine lining material as we can. But you don't want to go too far. This is not a step where you want to spend an inordinate amount of time on. And you also don't want to damage the text block. Um, but it is important because when you adhere that cloth directly to the spine, you need to have a solid foundation. If there are air pockets between the spine linings and the text block, it's not going to stick there and it becomes a weaker spot. So we want to clean up the spine, just as we did before. Make sure that everything's in good shape. and. We'll look at the boards of the book, and there's material there that we need to clean up as well. So trim that. And since we have benefit of board shear, we may use that as well. That'll be tipped on shortly. You'll see that. Walk over to the board shear. And a board shear is a wonderful tool to have. Many plate, smaller places won't. This one is cast iron, weighs several hundreds of pounds. But you can see that it makes very light work of cutting through board. If you don't have one, I would recommend using scissors or doing it on a cutting mat with a straight edge. But basically what you want is you just want a clean edge to that board because it will make it a stronger repair. It'll give it a better things, a better surface to adhere to. This is our tip-on, tip-in that we're doing of that flyleaf that we separated earlier. Make sure you position it accurately. Rub it down. When you're rubbing something down and that you applied glue to, always go from the inside of the sheet 
towards the outside edge so that you're not, if there's a, a blob, you're not smearing it across your end sheet, and then make sure that it's rubbed down well. And then what we're doing now is we're putting the boards to either side of that text block. And the reason we do that is to help support the text block when we put it into the press for the next steps. Again, it keeps the text block from flopping around and makes work easier, as well as being potentially less damaging. This is our hinge cloth that we use, and Marianne's measuring the spine fairly accurately there. Um, you, I, when I do it, I always make the hinge cloth be the exact length of the spine so that it goes from the top to the, excuse me, to the bottom. And cutting mats are great because most of them have a grid pattern, so you can line it up with that and then your straight edge so that you always get square cuts. And next step is, and this is just another aid, is folding it in half, and that allows you to see where the center is when you position it on the spine. There's a lot of little things like that that make your work easier, neater along the line, and that really don't take any more time. And one of the important things with this is efficiency. So right now what we're doing is we're applying the PVA to the spine of the book so that we can put that hinge cloth down. You want to get a really good coat of PVA. You want to brush the length along the length of the spine rather than side to side. And you always want to brush from the center towards the outside um, so that you don't get glue running down your fore edge or your bottom edge. The top edge, but and you want to pull it tight. One of the nice things with some of these fabrics is that even if they're starch filled, when you pull it really tight, some of the glue oozes through, and that means that it's really sticking. Depending on your environment, you want to make sure that you have a good coat of glue. The PVA, when it starts to get transparent. Um, it loses its drying, so it's not as tacky anymore. So sometimes if you're in a very dry place, it's better to put on maybe a little bit more than you think, but not a lot. You know, too much glue doesn't work either. Um, thinning the glue down with water makes it easier to spread, but at the same time, you're just thinning it down. That water will evaporate fairly quickly, and the glue will dry a lot faster. Again, we measure the spine, and we're going from shoulder edge to shoulder edge, and that measurement is important. If you make it too wide, and you put it, when you put it down onto the spine with the cloth and everything, you end up with a very puffy spine. If you make it too narrow, then you can have other problems with both aesthetically, you'll see that the spine stiffen doesn't fit, but you can also have problems with how the case fits together at the end, and you'll see why. So again, we're using the board shear to cut. You can use it for the folder stack. You can use a paper cutter. You can use a straight edge with a cutting mat. In terms of overall cost for the hand tools, cutting mat, and things like that, you can put together a very comprehensive basic circulating collections book repair kit for around $100. And those tools, if cared, well cared for, can last a lifetime. If you throw in a press, it doubles. But again, these are long-term investments. Box cutters are great because you just snap off the blades. You don't have to replace the whole blade. And you don't have to send it out for sharpening. And they are a little bit the, the matte steel is a little bit more durable than if you're thinking surgical scalpels. The cloth that we're using now is the library buckram, and just like with the previous repair, we measure it so that there's about half an inch on either side. 
in terms of the length. We'll cut it down. And you can't hear, you don't have the sound in the video that you're seeing, unfortunately. But you can acoustically hear when a blade is getting duller. At the very, when it's, you have a fresh blade, you hear almost nothing. Later on, you hear it kind of making more of a tearing noise. Here, we're putting the PVA onto the spine stiffener. As Marianne pointed out, grain direction is important, and what happens is the moisture of the adhesive causes the paper to expand. And you want that paper to expand along the width of the spine rather than the length, because that way you can smooth it out the easy, more easily and get rid of any wrinkles that might appear. So we lay it, center it onto that buckram, make sure it's well rubbed down. and throw away the waste paper. You don't want to be working on top of waste paper because there's glue there. It will transfer to your book and it'll look horrible as well as causing other damage. I like to fold the book cloth up along the edges of that spine stiffener. This, is, this material is a lot stiffer and you can see that than, for example, the um, Filmoplast T that we use. And what this does is allows me to more efficiently and more precisely place the spine, the spine piece that we're putting, preparing right now onto the spine of the book because you want that spine stiffener to be centered on the spine of the book and you want it also to be centered in terms of top to bottom, head to tail, so that it doesn't stick out on one end and come up short on the other. Right now we're positioning the book precisely onto the boards and this is really crucial because in our next step we're going to be adhering that spine stiffener, that spine piece that we just made, to the boards. So everything needs to be exactly in place. And again, using this hand press, it allows us to know that it's where it needs to be and then can work with the materials without worrying about things shifting. And we're going to place the adhesive just on the book cloth, not on the spine stiffener. And that's really critical because if you glue that spine stiffener to the spine of the book, you're restricting the opening and that can cause more damage to the book in the long term. The only books where you'll really have that the spine covering material attached to the text block are mass market paperbacks or older books with leather because that's how it was commonly done then and that's called a tight back book but we're not going to get into that in this presentation so oh you always you never want to have adhesive on the spine itself so now we position it and you can see those creases that we made in the cloth and those are helping us position it and you're using your fingers to feel where that spine stiffener is. And the, the, that feeling can be much more accurate than visually trying to figure out where it is. Next, we rub down in that groove and the adhesive on this book cloth, it slips a little bit, which a self-adhesive product will not do. So as we're rubbing it in, that cloth is sliding to conform more than it would otherwise and that's a good thing because you do want that it when you finish the book and that'll be a few steps down you will want that book cloth to be adhered to that inner joint which is the question that was asked by a participant earlier on again we rub it down
And now we open up the book and you can see where the groove is. And our next step will be to do the head and tail turn-ins. And depending on your skill level, depending on how fast you are, there are other ways that you can do this so that you don't have to apply glue at each step. But if you're just starting out, this is a much safer way to go because you're not dealing with a lot of adhesive where you don't expect it. And you won't get it necessarily, let's say, on your hands, on the your palms or something like that, and then transfer it. It allows you to work on one step at a time. Again, you want to make sure that when you rub it down, it's tight to the edges of the boards. You don't want those pocket pencil holder thingies. Um, it's a fairly technical term, and it's not an attractive or structurally helpful thing to have on the book. Now you, you'll notice that there's a lot of stickers in the book. We don't um, use the pockets anymore, but removing them is sometimes a lot more damaging than leaving them where they are. And if you look at that book plate on the left side, you can see a staining showing through. Maybe you can see that. That looks almost like it's in the form of an X. And that was one of our early forms of security tags that were in there. And the adhesive that was used was a solvent-based um, adhesive. And over time, that browns and becomes brittle. And they can sometimes fall out. But that's showing why you don't want to use tape. Make sure that the book is in right side up. Very critical after this stage. Otherwise, you may have to undo the repair. Position it precisely. Make sure that it fits around. You can see that the spine is tight to the text block. We're just going to rub it down in there again just to make sure it's sitting properly. Nice crisp groove. And now what we do is we open it up. We're going to actually clean up that hinge cloth. By folding, having folded that strip at the very beginning, it's centered already. But what you, we want to do is make it the same or as close to the width of the turn-ins on this fabric covering the spine. And you know, in this case, it worked out nicely to be approximately the width of the ruler. Flip it over, do it on the other side. And again, this is one of those things where you can see that the blade is getting a little bit duller. And like in Chicago politics, you want to change your blades early and often. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way in voting, but maybe that's a good thing. Again, position the book accurately. We lift up the fabric, make sure that everything's nice and neat. Lay a piece of waste paper in there. Again, a good even coat. You can see that we got a little bit on our fingers there, and we'll wipe that off before we go further so that we're not transferring it to anything else. And neatness counts with this. No matter how basic the repair, you always want to work as neatly as you can. So we fit the book, the spine, tight to the books, and then rub down that hinge cloth 
making sure that it's adhered in that groove area. You can use your, I usually start out with my fingers and then the folder, rub it down on the boards, make sure that nothing's oozing out, and then we skipped ahead a little bit, and I'll just pause this for a second, and you can see right here we've rubbed it down, and what you might do is you'll slip in a piece of either wax paper or clean waste paper just to make sure it doesn't transfer, you know, especially if, if adhesives oozed out. So now we'll go, and then you repeat that step on the other side. We're just showing you one side. So now what we're doing is the question that was asked earlier, what do you do with the spine that had the title on it? In this case, we're now cleaning off the original spine stiffener that was there. You can see how easily that came off. And we're going to trim off the edges, neaten things up. We're using the cutting mat for it right now. If you have a board share, you could also use that. But we thought it was important for you to be able to see how that's done. You want to make sure that when you tr the final width that you trim it to is just a hair narrower than the spine of your book, not including the grooves, because if it's wider, it goes on there. When you put the book on the shelf and you're pulling it off the shelf, you'll find your fingers catching, or the book next to it will catch on that, and it'll start to peel that spine off or cause other wear. Then we also trim it at the top and bottom. And you want to trim off as little as you need to, but as much as you have to. And that's not a very precise statement, but you want to be able to show as much of the titles there. If you don't want to have, if the call number is still there, leave it because. You know, if you have to re if the if it's still intact, why create another call number? Apply the PVA again, a good even coat. And you're brushing from the center outward, never the other way. Wipe your fingers, and then double check again, and position the spine on the, on the spine of the book. And one of the things that you can do when you're double checking again and the book's in the press without taking it out is the top edge is either usually either colored or just looks a lot dirtier than the bottom edge. So that's a good visual clue to make sure that it's in on right side up. So we see that there's a few questions that have come in, and we'll, we'll take care of it. One question, but okay, we have a question who they want to know what's the best way to remove glue from a brush that has not been cleaned between applications. Um, that's a point of contention, and I think pretty much every book repair program. And one of the things with brushes is you want to buy, again, the best brushes you can. They simply last a lot longer. But as was pointed out in the question, very often glue does get in. I like to soak my brushes in water um, up to, you know, most of the way up the bristles, but not beyond because you don't want the wood to rot. And most of these brushes are wood handles. Um, 
I use, before I start using a brush, I always wash it and I put a little um, of detergent will be in there and that washing and the softening and the wetting of the bristles helps prevent the adhesive from soaking too far in and makes cleaning easier. If the brushes get really, really hard, um, one of the things that you can do is, again, soak them a little bit, but I've learned that just a little bit of PVA, so, you know, if you're talking about a yogurt container, which some of us soak our brushes in, you know, the bigger ones like the pints, you know, maybe a drop or two of PVA mixed in with the water for whatever reason, that really softens up the PVA and you can get the bristles apart. It's a very time consuming process. Um, for cleaning, buy a really good flea comb. Yes, a flea comb. And you can use the plastic ones. Those wear out fairly quickly and you can throw them away. Or the better, more expensive ones that were they also with the um, what do you call them, the teeth of the comb kind of rotate, but that flea comb, the, the, the teeth are so close together that you can really use that to tease the bristles of the brush apart. But you really do want to make sure that you clean your brushes whenever you can, as soon after the repair, so don't let it sit. Okay, good answer. And we have another question. What do you do with plastic spiral bound, bound books? These have holes which are hard to deal with. Any ideas? Well, we actually do deal with some of those things more often than we would like to. And what we end up doing with them is taking off that spiral comb or this, you know, this whatever that happens to be. And we will you know, if there's enough room there, we will cut off in the guillotine, this gets a little bit more involved, that part of the book where the, the cutouts were, the holes were, and then we'll either send it out to a binder to rebind, or it is something that we can do in-house with what is kind of a pamphlet brochure binding. It'll end up being like a paperback, and that works well. But you're absolutely right that those larger holes made by those spiral combs make it difficult to repair, and effectively it is a loose leaf. Um, putting something across the spine doesn't really help much. There's other things that you can do. I've seen people, if the spiral is still in very good shape, you can take something like a pamphlet binder that either has a spine, a stiff spine that's in a width that matches up what you do, what you have in that spiral bound thing, and then take some pieces of archival quality corrugated and put that at the, on the back board of that pamphlet binder and then you're basically attaching the back cover of that spiral bound item to that board that raised panel and what that does is it levels out the text block of that spiral bound item so that it can close and that makes it easier to store it on the shelf but both of those things can be a little bit more complicated but spirals are definitely unsatisfying and problematic So, the, re the repairs that we showed you here are meant for circulating collections materials. One of the things that we didn't show was, you know, strengthening the corners. We do that by um, putting PVA into where it's burst open and then basically pressing it back together. But that's an area on most of our circulating collections items where we don't spend a lot of time if we don't have to. But what happens if you have more valuable items? And that's a question that comes up fairly often. And in that case, you really do not want to apply any of the techniques that we just showed you here unless you have a lot of previous experience. You're really going to get into the risk of causing a lot more damage on that item than you want to or than the item deserves. So, you know, if something is of historic or intrinsic value and significance, leave it alone, put it in a box. You can, you know, even buying a standard archival box and then filling in the areas around the edges if it's oversized so that the item doesn't shift can be a very good step to take. Um, 
you if it's you know if it's above your skill level again put it aside or what you can do is contact the American Institute of Conservation AIC and when you go to the online version of these slides on the Alex website or the URL that we provide at the end um, there are all these links that you'll see in the next sections are clickable in the PDF that you can download and so you can go to the AIC conser conservators referral list and you can say this is a leather bound book it has paper you put in your zip code and they will help you that will help you identify a qualified conservator and all the people on that referral list are professional associates which means that they've gone or higher which means that they've gone through a peer review process um, you may also want to you know if you find trying to find someone local contact the preservation department of the an academic library usually that's in your area and that's something you know if there are questions at the end you know, I may be able to answer those as well selected workshops it's important to check with your local regional library consortia and your closest research library preservation department for hands-on workshops or other training opportunities in your area. This is something that we have attended the workshops and really have been able to get a lot out of them. There's nothing better than doing it hands-on. Um, there's also under Amigos Library Services, there are, you can go and look at the book repair workshop supply list if you're not sure what supplies that you might need. There's the California Preservation Program, Lyricis, uh, Northeast Florida Information Network. The one closest to us is the us. Northeast Document Conservation Center and also Northwest Central. And there's a lot of other places that offer workshops that aren't on that list but these are usually these are some good starting points but you really do want to look into workshops through your local library consortia or others for that hands-on training we also show some recommended videos um, I've watched these and they're actually quite good the Amigos Library Services offers mending a book with the book repair tape and a hinge tightening instructions. Demco has 25 different videos which are very well narrated and all of these you can access on YouTube. SUNY New Pulse has a two-part series where you can observe the book repair American University, as well as University of North Carolina Health Services Library. These are just suggestions, and there are many, many different videos out there that you can watch that show hands-on book repair. But with all those things, you also, especially if you're, you know, you're looking on YouTube, there's a lot of stuff out there that you don't want to try at home and so you do want to be a little bit careful there's also you know even in this digital age there's a lot of stuff that exists in print the three basic book repair procedures was a pamphlet that was produced by ALA I referenced that earlier It was produced by Carol Dial and Pete Merrill Oldham and we put that online way back that shows hinge tightening um, some tip-ins, things like that. Gaylord has their book craft guide for simple techniques for the maintenance and repair of books. That's for circulating collections materials. That's actually that's a well-written publication that was created initially, I, I believe, by Nancy Schrock, who's at MIT and has written a lot on that subject. You'll also find that several, actually quite a few de preservation departments have their manuals online. 
The Alaska State Library has a rather good one. Cornell's is very good. Dartmouth's is very good. Indiana University's is very good. At Syracuse, we have more of our special collections things online, but we're going to be working on adding our circulating collections. There's also listservs where you can ask questions. BookArts-L is actually a listserv that I maintain. It's general BookArts, and some things are not appropriate for repair, but there's a lot of people who are conservators, who work in book repair, who are bookbinders, who are all very, very generous in sharing their advice. So if you're working on some things or you're trying to build your skill level by working on blank books or something like that, those are really good some really good people to ask, how do I do this? Where do I find out more? For more hardcore conservation questions, especially more towards special collections, but also historical artifacts, art objects, which many smaller libraries, public libraries have in their collections as well. There's conservation online, which is has the disk list as it's called and that is was actually one of the first listservs for preservation topics started in the late 80s and is an incredible resource and there's also PADGE which is now called something else and but that listserv is still called PADGE and it's part of ALALX and it's a list where workshops like this are announced it's where a lot of preservation program people working in libraries and things converse discuss some of the issues and you can actually learn a lot there or ask questions especially about where are workshops where can I go or training finally here's a list of selected vendors and these will all stock the supplies that we use for repairing circulating collections items and others they'll you know they'll also have some of more of the tapes, um, Brodart, Demco, Gaylord, Capco, a lot of self-adhesive products. Talus is on here. They're not so much into circulating collections book repair items, but it's a great place to get good tools and the hand presses, and then also university products. So we hope this has been helpful for you. We're going to try to answer some more of your questions. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to our Preservation Department webpage and you can also find more resources and links to online manuals, things like that, off of our research guide. We've also linked to the slides and video from this, but then also we started and have some of these videos on YouTube as well. We haven't publicized that a lot, but you can link to it through the presentation. So when you go and download the PDF of this, it will have links straight out to YouTube for those videos rather than embedding them, which makes it a lot easier to watch. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Neil Schumann, for helping make this possible. And we'll turn it over to any questions that we have. There's upcoming webinars, Julie. Do you want to speak to those? We have. Well, I can do that. This is Stephanie. I can oh, okay. do that towards Go ahead. the end. Did you want to answer? There's a few questions. Um, one is okay. about the grain of paper. Could you okay. talk about how you determine that a little bit? OK. Paper has something called grain. And the grain direction, a very simple test is take a piece of paper, 8 and a half by 11, that you'd use on your copier, and just get it wet. And what you can see, you can just mist it with water, but you can see how it starts to curl. And that's basically, it's expanding in that direction, in one direction, much more so than in, the, in another. So if you're making, if you're working with things like book cloth, um, paper, for more, so even for more complicated repairs, you want to have the grain direction of all those materials in the same lining up in the same way so that when you glue out like I did at the end you're gluing out that spine stiffener so that when you put it down on that book cloth the spine stiffener isn't expanding from left to right and the book cloth is expanding from top to bottom what that'll cause is it'll cause wrinkles um, it can cause warpage and other things 
And there's some good, if you get into more bookbinding tutorials, descriptions of that. But, for example, the 30 by 40 material that we use for making the spine stiffeners, which we cut down in a big board shear, but you can get it in smaller sheets as well, we mark that. And the grain on that runs along, is parallel to the long edge. Most copier paper is parallel on the short edge. And it's something where you can also tell, aside from wetting, just by gently folding it, you'll find that there's more resistance in one direction than the other. Um, but it is something to just be aware of and take note of and learn. Does that help? Um, yeah, that was a good explanation, I think. Um, the, there's one other question. Um, well, first of all, could you put up the previous screen just so people can jot Which down one? the oh, sponsor? Oh, yeah, yep. Oh, and then we'll do this one later. Sorry. Um, the other question was, do you use elastics or a press after the repair until dry? What position do you leave the books in to dry? You always want to let things dry flat. You want the way, the shape in which something dries at any step along the way is the shape which we'll eventually want to take. So if you have a text block and you've just glued it on the spine and it's shifted, it'll always want to be that way. Um, when I finish a repair, we let them dry flat and what we'll do is we'll stack them neatly spine to foredge to spine and we'll make sure that the boards line up at the groove and that way, you know, you'll have a nice, neat stack, and we'll put a brick on top, and we'll just let it dry effectively under light pressure. Okay. And we work um, in batches of five items at a time. Yeah, so a lot of people just use cloth-covered uh, bricks, right? You can use cloth-covered bricks. Um, you can use, yeah, cloth-covered bricks are really good. You can buy expensive weights, but cloth-covered bricks work well. There's another question. Um, do you use elastics or a... Oh, sorry. I already did that one. Is there a reason not to use PVA or wheat paste to repair a torn page? Um, we demonstrated tape. We demonstrated tape for our special collections materials. We most certainly do use Japanese paper and wheat paste because of that reversibility factor and because it's a much can be a much more invisible repair for the intended audience of this workshop given you know not knowing really what the skill levels are and even with our work studies students here at the university it's something that they can do a lot more easily with a lot less risk of causing damage if you use wheat paste with a Japanese paper or something and your adhesive is way too wet you can create tide lines and other staining um, you can have the pages warp there's it, it gets into a lot more complicated issues so for most of our circulating collections repairs and certainly in areas where you, the book isn't being kept for for the long term so let's say you know a heavily circulated book in a public library there's no reason to really worry about that reversibility factor you basically want to repair that tear so that it doesn't tear any further okay, thanks um following up on the how you weight things mm -hmm. um someone asked do you ever use rubber bands as a way of holding things while they I dry? Ne I never have, no. Um, I would probably, you know, rubber bands, other people might think ace bandages. It depends on what you're doing. It just gets a little bit more involved, and I don't, I don't really see a rubber band as giving the kind of pressure that you need. I think you'll get a lot more good, evenly distributed pressure out of a brick. Okay, well, I think that's about it for questions right now. Um, so thank you, Peter and Marianne, for a very informative presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us. I hope all of our participants will be able to use the tips and tricks you've shared to keep their collections in use and in good condition longer. And thank you again to the sponsor of today's webinar, Neil Schumann Publishers. Thank you to all our attendees. We hope you found today's session helpful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and return it to us. 
Your comments help us to evaluate and plan future continuing education offerings. If you're interested in viewing parts of the presentation again or sharing it with others, you will receive an email with a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. The presentation will also be archived and freely available at the Lex webinar website. Thanks also to Julie Reese and the Lex office for providing technical support for today's webinar. And lastly, we hope you'll join us again in the future. Alex will be offering two additional webinars in September, Floating Collections with Don Peters on September 21st, and RDA and Cartographic Materials with Paige Andrew on September 28th. Thank you all again for joining us today. Goodbye.